Hi, Noah. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so excited to talk to you. So start by giving me a sense of who Noah Galloway was before September 11th, 2001. You know, before September 11th, you know, I was just like any other 19 year old. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually people talk about young kids. I've seen a lot. I've been a lot of 19 year olds that know where they're going. I didn't know what I was doing in, in my world, in my life. I was just kind of I had a dead end job that I enjoyed just because it was manual labor. And I love pushing myself. What was your I enjoyed job? that. I worked in a plant. I, I did construction, then landscaping. And then when I turned 18, I was old enough. I started working in a plant. And I enjoyed it. Uh, and it wasn't until I considered the furthest I got to having any ambition was being a fireman. Mm. And I thought I'd let the military pay for that. So I, I tried to join the Air Force and I didn't have a high school education. Wait, and how, did you drop out of high school? I did. I dropped out of ninth grade just a couple of weeks into it. Wait, tell me. Tell me why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I didn't enjoy school. And it's funny. I come from a family of educators. My older sister has her doctorate in education. She's a professor at a university. My youngest sister teaches special ed. My mom retired from the board of education. But no, school did not make any sense to me. It wasn't going to take me anywhere. So I dropped out, went to work, was living on my own before I turned 17. Didn't come from a bad family. Just was like, nah. I got money. I'm going to go live somewhere. Yep. And that's what I did. And then decided I wanted to be a fireman, went to the Air Force, and they were like, look, we, you first, you need to get your GED. Second of all, we and the Navy won't take in GEDs, but the Army and Marines will. So I went and took the test to get my GED. And then they convinced me when I got the results that I needed to go to college. <laughs> And I was like, okay, from under, whatever. from a drop high school dropout to overeducated. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so, so did you go to college? I did. So then I ended up going to UAB university of Alabama, university of Alabama at Birmingham. Yep. And I wasn't there. That was the first semester when nine 11 happened. So nine 11 happened. Tell me exactly where you were, what you were doing and what was going on uh, through your head. So I didn't have class that morning. So I slept in and I got a phone call. Of course, I didn't have a cell phone. It was, you know, a, a landline from a buddy of mine, Justin. And he said, turn the TV on, you know, and I just, he didn't even say what channel I turned the TV on and that one twin tower was burning and the news reporters were talking about pilot error and we're all concerned about everyone in the building because it was on fire. Yeah. And then I watched with the rest of the world when that second plane hit. And I'll never forget the cameraman that was recording it live, the screams around the camera wow. as that second plane hit. And I watched for as long as I could. I went for a run and I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going in the military. And I have an uncle that's a Vietnam veteran who he always told me if I go in the military, go airborne infantry. So you're right up front. Wow. So I went to an I went to the Marines because they have great commercials <laughs> and <laughs> they couldn't guarantee me infantry. So then I went to the army and they're like, come on in. And then thankfully I ended up there's, you know, I'd have been happy with the Marines or the army, but thankfully I ended up once I got in the army under the hundred with the hundred first screaming Eagles out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And our division commander was general Petraeus who wow. decided who helped design the way we invaded Iraq in 2003, which I was part of. Right. So how long between uh, 9-11 and you joining the Army? Did oh, immediately. You go, oh, you went My, the next actually, day? Yes. I went, yeah. Well, they closed the recruiting offices because everything was going on. I went, said I was ready to go. I wanted to do this. And uh, my official date was October 1st. Okay. Um, there was a delay. There were so many people that were going in the military. October 1st, 2001. In one. Okay. Yes. So I was, you know, right there in line. It took what usually takes three days of in processing before you start basic training yeah. was three weeks. Wow. Uh, because there was so many guys that were coming in to join the military. I say guys because it was the infantry, but men and women yeah. all over the military were joining because of what happened. Wow. That's, that's so crazy. Okay. So you, you go into the army. What is it like at that time? 
you know, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I remember the the bus ride from Birmingham down to Columbus, Georgia, and then mm-hmm. Fort Benning. Mm-hmm. And I, like, I was so clueless to what was, you know, I was in the bus with guys who had been thinking about the military their entire lives. Once I got in basic training. And then after all that, like these guys knew so much and I, I didn't know anything. I was just learning as I went, which was, I think, better. Yeah. Like I didn't, I actually, even though I'm from Alabama, my dad did construction. We worked all the time. So he never got, a, he never took me hunting. So I never got into shooting. So I didn't have any bad habits. So basically, so I, go ahead. Well, yeah. So as I took, as I learned to shoot, I learned all the correct ways and I became, you know, an amazing shooter because I had no bad habits. So a lot of things that happened actually paid off because I was an idiot. <laughs> yeah. So basically your the being naive actually paid off yes. a little bit. Yes. Um, so when was your first deployment to Iraq? Uh, 2003, when we invaded Iraq. Got it. Uh, we loaded up in 2003, went to Kuwait, sat in the desert for three weeks until they finally said, all right, we're heading north to Baghdad. And we moved forward. And it was the most exciting thing I'd ever done in my life. Exciting. It was. You never slept in the same place twice. You know, you were just going village to village, building to building, room to room. And I absolutely loved it. And then when we hit Baghdad and we took over that, we pushed north to Mosul, settled in there. And I enjoyed it. I mean, it was it had its ups and downs. You know, it wasn't all just fun. It wasn't all easy. We lived with the locals. So there were things that would happen. Um, But it was I felt like. It was exciting, you know, to come from Alabama. I didn't travel. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Had you traveled yeah. before this? No. So I ended up realizing I like traveling and I like working with people that are in need. I, being an infantry soldier, yeah, there was the fight, the aggression, but I also enjoyed, you know, just do humanitarian work, you know, getting to know the locals, working with them. And there was a risk involved. So you got your highs and lows all together. And I'm an extreme person, you know, I'm, I'm either way up here, way down here. And that was giving me everything. And I loved it. So it was in Iraq in 2003. I re-enlisted. You re-enlisted. And, okay. Yeah. So I raised my right hand the day before Christmas saying I wanted to stay in. I, I chose to stay with the 101st, to stay with my company. And uh, So you I didn't even there. come back to the States or did you? Oh, no, I did. At the end of okay. my appointment. Okay. After a year being there, I returned back. But I never took leave. You get two weeks. When they started doing that, I was married and I called my now ex-wife, but we were married and told her I wasn't coming home on leave. And she said, why? And I said, because I'm too low on the totem pole. I lied to her. I didn't want to leave. I you loved it that there. much. I did. I did. No offense to her, you know, but um, I just, I, I enjoyed it. I wow. loved it. So, Okay, so I have so many questions, but uh, <laughs> so so you go a second time, correct? Yes. And then w- what was your job? And, and tell me about the events that led up to December 19th, 2005. Well, before, let me lead up to that second appointment. Okay. So I come back from Iraq. Uh, we have a big gap. They wanted the 101st back in Iraq, but we were making a lot of changes. I'm not we, the people in charge were making a lot of changes at Fort Campbell. So it delayed us. And me and my wife at the time had my first son, Colston, Mm -hmm. our first son. And when he was born, he was born prematurely and lost 75% of his small intestines. We spent three months at Vanderbilt children's hospital in Nashville. When we went home, he had a stomach tube, a central line. He had all these, you know, complications and they didn't want me going back to Iraq. And I, I was fine with that. I wanted to concentrate on my son. Well, then a month before my unit redeployed to Iraq, we're at the doctor's office, the central line and stomach tube, the central line, they wanted to get out pretty early. And they said, basically, it's like baby steroids, but feeding right into his heart. Mm-hmm. So it's not good for him. The stomach tube was constantly pumping, pumping nutrition into him because so much of his small intestines were gone. And that's where we, where we absorb our nutrients. Right. Well, they needed the central line out. The stomach tube, they said, would last until he was like six or seven years old. Well, like I said, a month before we we redeployed, 
the central line came out and the stomach tube came out. The doctors were super impressed. He wow. was doing so well that I was like, well, he's doing good. So I went up my chain of command. <laughs> saying, Noah. Gonna go <laughs> it just works. <laughs> to go back to Iraq. So I convinced them to let me go back. I remember a brigade commander saying, what about your son? I said, sir, I love him and I would miss him. But what about your children? What about the children of our men that are all deploying? This is what we do. So my second appointment was, it was harder on me emotionally. I mean, I'm, I get along with my ex-wife, but right. we leaving a spouse behind and a child behind are completely different. Mm -hmm. So I carried a picture of my son everywhere I went. I, I still enjoyed my deployment, but it was this, it was hard to be away from this new child I had. Um, and it was a bad deployment. Uh, we lost a lot of guys. It was in an area they refer to as the triangle of death. Mm. And I had also put in a packet to go special forces. Like mm -hmm. I loved what I was doing, working with the locals so much. I wanted to be doing it all the time. And special well, forces means like there's more training, more. Yeah. And you're there. Yeah. You're there. Sometimes your deployments are shorter, but you're going back and forth. Yep. And you train the locals how to take care of themselves. There's so much that goes on with that. And I wanted to be part of that. So I get to Iraq, we're on this bad deployment and the battalion commander comes to our area and says, Galloway, pack your stuff. You got to head back to the States to go to selection. That's one of the schools to okay. try to get, you know, try to get, I'm not one of those guys that said, oh, I was going to be, I don't know. Yeah. But I turned it down. I was like, I'm not taking a school over a deployment. Ooh. And he looked at me like I was crazy because it was a bad deployment. And so I stayed. And then December 19th, 2005, our platoon, about 30 guys, had two missions we had to run. We were in an area that was too big for our company size element. So we were always short on men. Got it. Well, the group I was with, we finished first. We headed back to an old potato factory that we were living out of. And when we got there, I laid down because when you live in a combat zone, not on a camp, we did not live on a camp and you get a chance to rest, you take it because you never yeah. know when you might get attacked and you're, you're up for a long time. Well, as soon as I laid, I, I dozed off my platoon leader, Lieutenant Jerry Edson woke me up and said, Hey, Galloway, we got to take the Humvees to go pick up the rest of the platoon. There's nothing important going on. We're just picking them up, coming back and we need empty seats in the Humvee. Just letting you know we were leaving. And I jumped up and said, no, sir, you go, I go. And I'm driving the lead vehicle. Wow. So we take off about two o'clock in the morning, night vision goggles on, headlights off, and we're flying down a road. And with the, with night vision goggles, you can see well, but you can't see everything. Yeah. And what I didn't see that night was a trip wire stretched across the road. Wow. And when my front tires hit it, it detonated a roadside bomb large enough that okay. when it hit my door, it threw this 9,000 pound armored Humvee flying through the air and landing in a canal running adjacent to the road. How many people in the Humvee with you? So there were three of us in the vehicle, a gunner and uh, my platoon leader. And thankfully, we landed wheels down in the water okay. because I was not completely unconscious. They said the water was up to my chest. Wow. Huge hole in my jaw. Arm was taken off immediately. Jerry climbed out, had shrap you know, shrapnel cut all of the bulletproof glass, cut him all up. The gunner had shrapnel on his legs. They climbed out. They thought I was already dead. They struggled to get up the embankment. The two vehicles that were behind us saw the explosion. It was so bright in their night vision goggles. They blew through it, didn't hit us. So they wow. thought we were further ahead. So they kept going. And that's when my friend Jerry said that he really experienced fear. It was complete darkness. I'm down in the water. He doesn't know where it, his helmet is weapon he's thinking we're about to get hit with a secondary attack he looks down there's a kevlar helmet on the ground he picks it up puts it on he said it was just covered in blood and it was he looked at it, it was my helmet wow so he's like we got it so then the vehicles eventually come back they struggle to get me out of the vehicle into another vehicle back to the potato factory medics worked on me there helicopter picked me up took me to a camp in baghdad doctors worked on me there baghdad to germany Germany to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And at this point, it had been five days. 
it was Christmas Day, and I woke up and I was unaware of where I was or how I got there. So in those five days, you have no memory of the incident. You have no memory of the transportation. I remember, I vaguely remember being in Germany. Okay. I woke up and it was very strange. I didn't know where I was, how I got there. I had had a dream with all the medication that someone had said that the, because we were hitting roadside bombs all yeah. the time. And some big, some small, so you would just hit them, keep moving. But I had a dream that someone said these explosions were so hot, it would fuse your bones together. Well, I I was, on a, I think it was me, I had that dream because my mouth was wired shut. And I yeah. didn't know I, what had happened. And I remember laying there trying to pry my mouth open. Wow. And I didn't even know I didn't have another arm or that my leg was gone. Like I was so just out of it. And I, I remember the flight out of Germany and these three Air Force medics that were so kind to me, took care of me, loading me up on the bird and then us flying. And I remember one of them saying, we're about to land. I'm going to give you something. You're going to go to sleep and you'll wake up and you'll be in your room at Walter Reed. And then I was out and woke up as my parents were coming in. Wow. And so. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, so I, I remember, and it's funny because I do remember my parents walking in the room. It was late at night. They, then they told me later that usually the families are prepped before they get in. And it was so late at night, no one was there. And they just found out where my room was and got right to me. And they'd also went through the struggle of the government saying, get your passports ready. We're flying you to Germany. Mm. The military didn't think I was going to survive. So they were going to keep me alive till my parents got to say goodbye. And then they called my parents and said, he's stable enough. We're flying him out today to D.C. So they transitioned them to D.C. So they're already, you know, what's going on? Well, when they come in, I remember when I saw my mom. And this isn't me trying to sound like some hero. This is mm. I, I remember some of the back of my mind saying smile so she knows you're OK. And I had no idea what condition I was in. Wow. And later, my mom and I, it was years later, we talked about it. And she said that she was so terrified of how the news, that the information she was getting was so all over the place. She didn't know what she was walking into. And she said she walked in. I'm getting choked up saying it. <laughs> that when she walked in, I smiled. And it just yeah. made everything okay. Wow. It was just one of those moments where you kind of, you're not thinking. It just happens. That's that's incredible. So you wake up on Christmas Day, and what were the injuries that you sustained? Mm. So my left arm was taken off, you know, traumatically from the explosion. Both my legs were severely injured because mm -hmm. uh, I talked to medics years later that said they thought I'd also lose my right leg, but they ended up saving it. My left leg was amputated. Um, I'm considered above the knee, but I'm through the knee. I have no joint. I have my entire femur bone, but I have nothing to bend. Uh, so I have to use a prosthetic with a knee joint in the prosthetic. I had my jaw was shattered, severe, excuse me, severe injuries to my right hand. Uh, and that was, that was pretty much it. Uh, in, no internal organs were, were affected. So that's really good. So yeah, there was just the limbs that were hanging out. <laughs> that's yeah. what was hurt. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting because uh, when I read about your story, it reminded me of um, Kyle Carpenter, who got uh, a Medal of Honor. Um, he was in Afghanistan. Uh, basically, you know, he I think he was on a roof and uh, explosion happened and he woke up as well and didn't really remember anything. Um, and he said, like, he had such a hard time coming back because he was like, in the army, you think either I come back totally fine or I come or back in a box. Out. Yes. And that's, and I've always told people is that in between, I never expected. That is so funny. It doesn't surprise me. A lot of us, whether we want to admit it or not, think alike. That's why we're, right. we end up in the jobs we're in. Uh, Cause I mean, your husband being a veteran, he could tell you the hardest people on veterans are other veterans. We're always right. like, ah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Kyle Carpenter's right. Like you either expect to come home or come back, you know, in a, in a body bag and you don't expect that in between. Right. That was terrifying. And the other thing that really hit me the hardest, 
the injuries were bad, but I fell in love with the military, with the army, with deployments. Mm -hmm. And I found, I felt like I found a career. Most people go their entire lives to never find a career. And then one day I wake up and it was over. I struggled yeah. with that more than the injuries. Wow. So, okay. So obviously there were these physical injuries, but you also had mental ones that nobody ever really can see. Um, I, I recently wrote about uh, the danger of labeling people, the, the danger of other people labeling you or you labeling yourself. So when you come back, you're still Noah Galloway, but to everybody else, you're Noah Galloway, the, the wounded veteran, right? Yes. Even to this day, you, I deal with that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, and I try to tell other veterans, look, be proud of the time you serve, but that's a chapter in your life. In yeah. fact, my chapter, it was only five years, and I loved it, and I'm proud of it. But you know what? I've done so many other things since then. You know, I'm also a father. I did a um, an Instagram post the other day about that because I get so upset. Here we are. We want to improve veteran suicide, but when we talk about veterans, we act like that's all we are, crazy yep. And we kill ourselves. You know what? NFL players have a high suicide rate. Yeah. That's just as important as us. The entire country has a suicide issue that we need to deal with. Don't label us as just that. And people will, when you label people, they will become what they're labeled. I, I when I growing up, I grew up in a town that was literally on the other side of the railroad tracks of, you know, who I ended up married, my ex-wife that I have my son with. You know, I was on the bad part of town. And I remember as a teenager, we were treated like we were the, the bad kids. So what did we do? We lived up to it. And that's what happens. Yeah. That, I mean, there's so many things in here, but like, for example, I know, um, you know, at Fortune, I covered uh, venture capital and entrepreneurship and small business. There are so many veterans who are CEOs, who are business yes. owners, who are venture capitalists, and they rarely, well, some of them do talk about being veterans, but it's not the first label. And I think it's probably on purpose because they don't want to be put in some box, yes. right? Yes. There are, you know, there are musicians. Mm -hmm. I've met tons of musicians. And then it's like, I've been following their music this whole time. Then you find out, oh my God, you were in the military, you deployed or, you know, and because it is, it does, you know, you, you want to take pride in being a veteran and everyone no one wants to talk ill of veterans, but let's be real. No one's hiring us because of the way we're labeled. Mm. And then too many, then there are those veterans who are riding the line and it easily pushes them over when we're convinced this is who we are. Every movie, everything portrays us yes. as broken and we're not. There are a lot, not just CEOs, but just successful people. I like to think I'm successful. And yeah. yes, being a veteran and being an injured veteran, got me attention. So it's hard for me to, to argue that, but I don't want to just be that. Right. You know, I am, I have juggled being, you know, divorced and being, you know, a, a good father with my three kids and, and managing life and fitness and everything else. Easily somebody could label you an ultra athlete or yes. a tough mutter. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I want to, so in your book, living with no excuses, you wrote, uh, after you came back to the U.S., you, you said, I'd sit at home and drink and smoke and sleep. That's all I did. So can yeah. you just describe to me those first few months after you've, you know, you're transitioning, you're making your recovery. How did you feel? Uh, lost, confused, didn't know. And I think, like I said, you know, I found this career and it was taken away. And then even the thing like I did manual labor mm. before I got injured, I had I was like, well, what do I do now? You know, I, 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 I got remarried, rushed into a second marriage uh, that didn't work out because I was in this dark place. And thankfully, you know, we get along well now, too. I, I, look, I have two ex-wives because I have kids with both of them. And I'm very fortunate mm -hmm. because uh, these two women, we've had our issues, but we all get along. Yeah. Me and you know, my first ex-wife's husband get along, me and my second wife and her boyfriend, <laughs> and they love my girlfriend. You know what I mean? It's that we are one big family because it, it does. It takes a village to raise the kids. Um, but I'm very fortunate that we do that. But to go through all that, well, I'm going back to, yeah, being injured. Like I rushed into this marriage and then I was just this sad shell of a man. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. But then I was also trying to hide it. Yeah. I didn't want to admit that I was weak. Not well, not weak, that I was scared and confused. And so you, I think oh, go ahead. No, no, no. So, so you started drinking mm. to kind of do yes. all those I, feelings. So I got because I, I took pride in the fact that I got off all this medication, but all I started doing was self-medicating, mm. you know, and it was doing me no good. And I was in denial and I just was, I didn't know how bad my depression was until I finally came out of it, realizing I needed to be a better father. And so as I came out of it, looked back, I was like, oh my God, like that was, it was such a bad place I was in. So in your book, there's, I, I think um, one of the, those moments that a lot of people would consider a rock bottom is you have been drinking and you get pulled over by police, but you say that that police officer who arrested you for a DUI actually saved your life. Can you explain that? Because, I mean, it was a tough situation, you know, in a small town, you know, you get pulled over and they see a purple heart tag. They walk up, there's a guy missing an arm and a leg. The war's a right. big deal in the news. And they're like, how far do you have to go? And you know, I'm like, just right down the road, you know? Yeah. And the night that I got hit, when I got that that police officer that didn't know who I was and did me, a, he did me a huge favor because I needed that. I, I ended up, you know, spending 10 days in the county jail because I made the judge mad contempt of court because I was just clueless. I was just oblivious. I didn't care. I was just. And it was a sad place. And it was when I was locked up that I, I was in this this county jail that was one of those county jails that there were people heading to the penitentiary. And I was talking to these guys and I was like, wow, uh, I can still recover from this. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like I can turn this around. I don't need to keep going down this rabbit hole. And so it was that police officer, those guys I talked to that were a huge help. And I ran across one. Uh, one of those guys, I mean, this was back in 2007, 2006, maybe. And I was doing some work with, um, you know, we're feeding the homeless uh, with Red Cross. And one of the guys that wow. I'd met in the county was there. And he remembered us having conversations and talking. Wow. And he was so happy to see where I was going. And he was proud to tell me that he was staying there, but about to leave because he'd gotten a job. He was changed his life it took him a long time but you know so it was just it was a unique experience to go through and I'm very I don't regret any of it that happened but yeah that police officer really helped me out a lot so when you were in jail you talk about how you were giving a lot of the guys advice that you were like damn I think I should take that myself yes. what were you it, saying that hit you see it's funny you said because I didn't know if I was going to go into that part of the story but no that's what <laughs> the guy I ran into he was like no I remembered what you said to me because this is a guy that you know I'd learned that he'd been in and out of juvenile detention facilities the entire life because his his uh he don't know what happened to his parents you know all this so and I was I told him I said you know people request me as a veteran to speak to kids all the time I said I can talk about being a veteran but what I can't talk about is going through what you've been through. Mm. And I was like, you can connect to kids that are going through what you're going through that I can't reach. I said, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. This, and, But I was telling him this and then was kind of like, whoa, crap. I need to, yeah, I need to start doing this myself. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question, which in your book, you write, one thing about my depression, I hid it very well. Now looking back, it was pretty obvious. So I guess the more <laughs> accurate statement is that the person I was hiding from the most was myself. And that yes. hit me because it's like, everybody does that. Everybody tries to kind of lie to themselves. Like, I don't have a problem. Like everybody else is the problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you remember in what moment you recognize that and when you actually said, I need to dig myself out of this? Yes, I do. Um, so you know, there's a, a, a group of things that kind of happened. And one of them was something I did a lot. There was a, a full length mirror mm -hmm. in my bedroom and I would just look at it. And all I could see was my injuries. You know, I wasn't looking at the others. I wouldn't look at anything else. And I was just, I was big into fitness my entire life. I'd gotten out of shape, you know, I was injured, all these different things. And I was just, it would make me angry. And that would just, 
be something I do just to stir the pot with my own emotions. But one day it's like I was doing that. And then I walk out in the living room and my three kids were very young and they're all sitting on the couch watching TV. And I realized to my two boys, I'm showing them what a man is and that's what they're going to become one day. And to my little girl, I'm showing her how a man's supposed to act. Mm. That's what she's going to look for one day. And that terrified me. That, I mean, I turned and all of a sudden that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, I got to I gotta make a change and it has to happen fast. When I always tell people that life isn't a movie, that things don't just fix overnight. But the thought of my three kids, oh, I still screwed up, still made mistakes. Going to the county happened after that realization. And I was like, oh my God, this is like every time I screwed up, I think of the kids and it'd get me motivated. To, okay. I got to push harder. I got to do better. Got to do better. And I credit my kids for every bit of success I have. Wow. Without a doubt. That's amazing. And it reminds me, I recently um, was researching uh, like Anthony Bourdain and he wrote a book in which he was extremely honest and vulnerable about his drug addiction, heroin, everything. And he said something that he said, if you're open and honest about the things you went through, very little can hurt you. Nobody can use that against you. You spent a whole chapter in your book talking about being in jail. Mm -hmm. Many people would gloss over that, said, you know, but like, I think that it, it's interesting that you talk about your mistakes and your successes equally. Like you don't see them as like, you know, I'm a different person. It's like, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one thing, so, okay, so you, you had that moment and then you said fitness, like I'm going to go to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. But you kept quitting. Why do you think that consistency was so hard for you in the beginning? You know, I think it's, I think that, can, I think everyone goes through that. Because um, I mean, look at anyone you've ever talked to that has tried to get in shape or saw a friend that's tried to lose weight they try and it just doesn't happen as quick as they want it to. Or the fact that I was in fitness before, nothing was the same. I wasn't recovering. You know, I was like, oh, and what didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think at the beginning I was, yeah, I just wasn't ready. I wasn't there. I just wasn't ready. The body had nothing to do with it. Uh, mentally and emotionally, I wasn't ready. And once I got better and started actually changing the way I was eating, mm. you know, and taking care of myself, thinking about what was going into my body. Then that's the biggest change I made. So that when I got back in the gym, it, that last time that I went in, which was the time that has lasted this long yeah, was in a 24 hour gym that I joined and would work out at two o'clock in the morning was when no one was there. And then I started looking at it differently. I quit looking at it as, why can't I do what I used to do? And, okay, well, let's figure out. Because there was nothing back then. There were no books, no magazines. You couldn't Google anything that told you how to work out Miss Narnal Leg. So then I decided, okay, well, challenge accepted. I'm going to figure out how to work out my left side, my right side, you know, everything. And so once I started looking at it that way, that's when it changed. But I had to be ready. I was reading an article about you doing a tough mutter and there are these pictures that are so insane. And I showed my husband, he goes, this guy is a savage. He's doing things that people <laughs> with like, you know, the most built guys can't do. But here's what I want to ask you. So you wrote, I needed to quit concentrating on what I had lost and focus on what I had, what left. I had left. Can you explain the Like, I, I get the, you know, I, I changed my mindset, but can you talk about practically how you change that mindset? You know, I don't, I could come up with some corny yeah. things to say, <laughs> oh, you want to be like me? This is what you have to do. No, that's not, people put those lies out all the time. No, I think it goes back to, you know, I said I had to be ready here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the most important thing. And that's why, like, I'm big on pushing mental health. Most complicated organ in your body is between your ears and we got to take care of it. But it was when my mind was ready that I was able to actually start pushing myself physically. And then with that to accept, Hey, you know what? I, yeah, I'm missing an arm and a leg. Life is different than it was for the first 24 years of my life. Now, what am I going to do with it? You know what I mean? And I, yeah. I took 
I love going and doing Tough Mudders, all these different off course races and doing things that challenged myself and challenging myself then got me attention. I was one of the first guys that was an amputee doing these off course races. And then it just got bigger and bigger. And you, there were guys everywhere doing it. It was amazing. I remember I met, I was at the off course racing championship in Ohio. I dropped by, um, they wanted me there. So I came through, I was just on the cover of men's health. So all these people want to see me. I'm, I met a guy from Europe that was missing his arm. And he said that grow, he, from birth, he said, growing up, he played soccer. It was just never exciting for him. And someone showed him videos of me wow. doing Tough mutters, And he's like, I'll start doing those. So then here he was. He traveled to another country to be in the World you know, Ultra Course Racing Championship. We meet. And he told, then he tells me, not only did I motivate him to get into it, but he said he always skipped the monkey bars mm-hmm. because he has one arm. And he said, and then one day he sees a video of me going across monkey bars with one arm and one leg, like use my arm, my leg. And he said to me, excuse my language, but he goes, shit, I guess now I have to do monkey bars. <laughs> <laughs> it's and kind I of love like- that. It's that level of competition, but also seeing something that you thought previously couldn't be done. Once somebody else does it, you're like, I have no excuse left now. Yes. You do have this mental framework that I love. And once I heard it, I can't get it out of my head. Can you explain what you call the Al Bundy effect? (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, I've always, so that's in the book. That I saw in an interview. Okay, dang! I always thought, I always wonder if it was in the book. So, uh, the Al Bundy effect, Al Bundy, Al Bundy effect, Al Bundy from Married with Children. Yep, is a depressed um, shoe salesman that is unhappy with life in general, and the only time he gets excited is when he talks about scoring four touchdowns in a single football game. You know, this is in high school. That's the only time he gets excited, and I, I see that as. I see a lot of veterans and other people that do it, but I talked, I love to point out to veterans, you can't live in the past because then you'll never be satisfied with what you're doing now. And you'll never progress. You'll never challenge yourself again because you've, you've peaked too soon, but you only peak when you decide you've peaked. Mm. So Al Bundy chose to peak in high school and never did anything else. And I asked, like I said earlier, look, as a veteran, Yeah, I served in the military, loved wearing the uniform, proud that I had that American flag patch on my arm, but it was a chapter in my life, Mm. a chapter. You know what? The last couple of years after being on Men's Health, Dancing with the Stars, doing American Grit, oh my God, I've traveled all over. People have been excited to meet me. Speeches everywhere made all kind of just stupid money, and then everything stops. Well, what do we do now? Well, it's time to start another chapter. Hey, that was a great run. I enjoyed it. You know what? My life's not over. Whether I'm in the public eye or not, Noah Galloway is going to keep doing something, whether yeah. people know it or not. Me, my family are going to have a good time. We're going to work and do the next thing that we have to. And I try to show my kids that. Look, hey, guess what? This Christmas isn't going to be as, 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 as big as the other Christmas because dad took an 8% pay cut when everything stopped. But hey, you know what? We're doing great. And it's yeah. okay. And we're going to figure out what we're doing next. The reason I love that so much is because so few of us like take the time to stop and think like where we live. Like, am I living is that 20 year old? And I'm still thinking about that. But like in those situations, who you are today is totally different from who you were when you were 18, 19, 20. But we kind of forget that we've evolved as human beings and we don't have to be sad anymore or whatever it is. Um, or- yeah. Or we forget that, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can start over. You can start a new thing. I was talking with a good friend of mine the other day who is, you know, he is much older than I am. He's getting close to 60 and he's gotten, he's put on weight. His joints hurt this and that. And I was like, I told him, I said, well, are you thinking about changing your eating habits? Maybe getting into to yoga, something that's, you know, not as intense as, you know, running. You can't do that right now, but start building up. But he just had this look like, man, nah, I'm at this age now. I'm like, oh, I would never. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, my father has never been a man that has ever said, well, when you get my age or right. complained about his age. And I think that has rubbed off on me because my entire life, I've always 
because I dropped out of school, I've always had friends of mine that were much older than me because I had to go to the workforce early, this and that. And I always had people tell me, wait till you get to my age. And then when I got to their age, I'm like, I feel pretty amazing. And then I get to the next group. I'm like, because here I am, like my next birthday, I'll be 40. I was just on the phone with my older sister who's, you know, closer to 50 than 40. And I told her, I said, you know what? 40 and 50 don't seem as bad as it did when we were kids. I said, because I feel pretty good. Like, I'm sorry, did we see J-Lo at the, the oh, Super yes. Bowl at 50 if years old? <laughs> if that doesn't tell you something right there, I mean, she's gorgeous and she's still pushing herself because yeah. that's what, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, genetics as well. But the we're only as happy as we allow ourselves to be and that's taking care of ourselves. I, I talk a lot about this, like with family, uh, because my family moved to the U.S. when from Bulgaria, mm-hmm. I still have a lot of par- uh grandparents and great grandparents living in Bulgaria. And then you see women the same age as my grandmother in Bulgaria, but living in the U S they still take care of themselves. They do yoga, they exercise, they do all these things because to them being a grandmother doesn't mean my life is over. I have to be this old lady. Whereas in other cultures, it's like it would be looked down upon you for going and getting like your nails done or going to a yoga class. It has to be the stereotypical yeah grandmother that and you see that a lot in the south mm, true you know it's uh, you know I, of course it's 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 evolving i feel like a lot of people are fitness has become a lot more important i think that once you know however long it takes uh with vaccines and anything that happens uh with what we're going through right now i'm hoping that this will be a huge push for fitness on a global level yeah. Because now so many people have been put into the same level of complacency and sitting yes. around that it will motivate people. Because I think a lot of people are intimidated by those of us who work out all the time. And I've always told people, if you walk into a gym, fitness is no different than any other religion, cult, whatever. When you're excited about something, you want to share it. And people think that those of us who are in the gym and, and fit, that's just we, we look down upon those who are out of shape. No, if you're out of shape and you walk into a gym, oh. walk up to the fittest person in there and be like, hey, I don't know what I'm doing and watch them stop what they are doing and help you in any way possible because yeah. they're excited that someone else has come in. But yep. people don't see that because they are. And I did the same thing. I was in fitness and then got injured and it was intimidating to get back into fitness. That's why so you I went to the gym that. like at 2 a.m., right? 2 a.m., yeah. And so it it is, it's that, intimidation is there but i think that now there'll be more people on on a similar level that's like hey let's all get back into shape together so i'm really hoping there'll be a huge health and fitness push globally as we come out of this it's definitely a cult (laughs) but it's a good one it's a good one um so okay so when you speaking of fitness when you were on the cover of men's health magazine uh i think you said first veteran first amputee ever Wow. Mm-hmm. World's uh, largest men's magazine. Yeah. Don't and, throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, throw, throw it in there. Um, and it's funny because like, you know, I read the article, your photo, just all the, the, the photos and the article were just extremely masculine, right? You're like the guy's guy. It, it was called the ultimate, <laughs> ultimate guy. guy. Yeah. What did, when that happened, what did that mean to you? Uh, actually, it terrified me. Really? It, yeah, I did all my interviews. It was a big deal. And it actually, I thought I looked like a jerk to other veterans. I thought, no, I was like, veterans aren't going to like me. Huh. You know, I was like, I look arrogant. And then veterans and, and veteran spouses started reaching out to me, thanking me for being a positive image of veterans. And it really, because it did, it, it it did. It made me look like this, this man's <laughs> man. You know what I mean? It was really cool. But it also just made me feel very insecure because I thought I looked bad, like I was trying to toot my own horn. I wasn't trying to do that. And it was the veterans community that reached out to me that made me feel like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. What I love about your story is like you basically say what's whatever's on your mind and you don't try to hide things to make yourself look better. So the thing that I 
love that you say is like, you love the golden girls. You love the notebook, like things that people are like, Oh, I would never say that. Cause I'm a man. Right. So in the book you wrote, my anger issues went down when I allowed the emotions to come out. If you hold in that sadness, it's going to come out as anger. Sometimes you just need a moment to cry. So what do you say to people who say like real men don't show their emotions? I'd be like, no, they do. And they just, it comes out in a negative way. And if you let it come out in a negative way, what people don't realize, this is for men and women. If you hold that sadness in, it's going to come out as anger. And if it comes out as anger, we don't think clearly when we're angry. So you're not a reliable person. You know what I mean? You're not thinking as clearly as what you're capable of. You know, they're not bad people. It's just they're deflecting from one emotion and it's coming out another. I'll be honest, last night, I don't know what has been going on with me lately, but I'll admit it. Last night, me and my daughter watched the first Home Alone. Oh, love. Oh, Great movie. Uh, <laughs> when, his, when his mom gets there. Oh, what? What? Oh, and then he looks out the window and the neighbor that they all thought was this mean old man uh, in the church tells him that I haven't talked to my son in years. He's like, well, why don't you reach out to him? I'm afraid he won't talk to me. That, and he looks out and I was like, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it does, but it feels good to have those emotions. There I am. I'm a, I'm teaching my daughter yes. and my sons have seen me get, I'm not walking around just crying like a baby in public. You know what I mean? But yeah. no, you're, we're, our emotions happen because of what's going on inside. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, and because if you express it as anger, people don't have the same sort of empathy as if, you know, you were, it was another emotion, which is really unfortunate because anger a lot of times is sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when you came back talking to veterans, meeting these young people who have been in the military, is there something that, you feel like they don't get enough support with, whether it's, you know, beyond mental health, like things that there's not enough support for young veterans. You know, I don't, I get, I don't know. That's, that's like, one has always been the, we focus more on the negative Mm -hmm. of our military and our veterans than the positive and how successful. And not to mention, you know, people love to talk about, oh, this generation, this generation, you know, I not too long ago, like there were two wars going on at one time. Yeah. And we still had men and women joining the military. I was like, you're going to talk bad about a generation of men and women that are still yep. joining the military? So it's like, no, I was just down at Fort Benning not too long ago and got to speak to the recruits that are in basic training. And I thought it was amazing uh, yeah. because these are – people that are there that whatever good or bad that happens if we go to war we don't they're there and that's what it's all about and i think there's a lot of good that happens and then you know the military is just this i I enjoyed my time in you know you learn so much about who you are you know how to work with others and yeah i feel like they deserve more credit more than just i agree i mean i feel like the image that we're given yeah what is what really hurts. Right. It's interesting. Uh, And I think because the the war has gone on for so long, it stopped, you know, people have stopped talking about it. They've stopped Mm -hmm. covering it in uh, the same way that they did early on. So it's just like, there's still many people deployed right now. It becomes political. It becomes political too. And that's, that's, that's another thing that happens to our military and our veterans. We're just a pawn. Mm -hmm. And you can't, if you, if someone is thinking of just one side of the politics that does it and thinks the, their side isn't, you're an idiot because both sides use us as pawns because no one will publicly attack veterans or veterans care or sure. they'll dump money in places, whether it's good for it or not, just to say we did. And it just doesn't do any good for us. Yeah. I think the, the, be, the, the best that's going to do for veterans, veterans care, whether it's the VA, whatever, you know, and then our active duty military is it takes us veterans stepping up and speaking out and doing things, you know, whether it's getting into politics or because, I mean, I looked at a lot of senators and congressmen of both sides of the aisle, and I love to see veterans, veterans that are doing it. You know what I mean? And then when it comes to people that are speaking out and talking about what's good and bad with the VA, I tell veterans now, you don't have to be in the public eye. But if you're not enrolled in the VA mm-hmm. and, and and speaking up, if you think something needs to be improved, you're not doing anything for us or the next generation behind us. 
yeah. Vietnam veterans fought hard to get the VA to where it is today. It's up to us to keep that going and always improving. No, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership is without a doubt. Um, leadership is leading from the front. There is no, you know, what's that, you know, that meme you see where the guy is pulling with them and the other huh. one's being pulled. Yeah, I think that's real leadership, but a real leader also knows when to step back. I think that is so hard for people to know when to step back. Uh, I will give you an example of some and a general that impressed me. Okay. It was in Iraq, Christmas Day, 2005. An explosion goes off. We hear it. We rush over. Humvee is destroyed. Everything in it is destroyed. And it was an MP unit that had come through our area. And I was literally picking up body parts, you know, me and some guys and, and weapons, anything that had flown apart. And the general over that unit came by and he started barking orders at my platoon leader. And mm-hmm. I walked by and I mean, I had both my hands full of human flesh That's, and yeah. I stopped and yelled at that general and told him that we had this taken care of. We've been here for 45 minutes. I rattled off sensitive items we found. I don't even know. It's like, I don't know where, how I knew. I just was like, blah, 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 this, that. And my platoon leader, uh, Jerry, who was in the home with me, said he remembers looking at me like, what are you doing? And I just turned and walked off. And then later that as that was, we were there, I'd gotten a canal and was getting a 50 cal out of the water. And I came out of the water and that general walks up and shakes my hand, gives me a coin and wow. thanks me for my service. And, 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 and tells me he appreciates what me and the guys have done for his, his men. And I thought that was that that's good leadership. He knew we were in a stressful situation. Right. He come in doing his thing, barking orders. And I just couldn't take it. And yeah. he stepped back. And that is an example of good leadership. Not saying that you have to get yelled at, mm-hmm. but knowing when to step back and then knowing when to lead from the front. Yeah. So uh, Kyle Carpenter, who I, I mentioned earlier, he basically jumped on a grenade. Um, uh, to, that's not, okay. Yeah. I, know yeah, yeah, yeah. Kyle, so, I know who Kyle is. Yep. Yes. Uh, so he said about leadership, there is someone somewhere who is looking at you and learning from you. You can be extraordinary in the most normal occasions and settings. What do you think about that? Given that you have children and, and you've seen um, this. That is spot on. I, Cause I tell people, I give speeches and I'm like, you don't, you don't have to be in the public eye. Someone is watching. That's exactly what Kyle said. It's doing the right thing, you know, cause there are always eyes watching and we are building the next generation. You know what I mean? And I point that out to people when they want to say, Oh, this generation, I'm like, well, if you see bad in the generation around you as well, you created it. Yeah, true. You create, cause I got, I got three kids that, yeah, they love video games. They also love playing outside. They also <laughs> love fitness. They push themselves. They challenge themselves. They're intelligent. They think for themselves because that's who I'm trying to create. You know, I don't want to force anything on them. I want them to enjoy themselves, but also they see that dad doesn't let anything stop them. Dad stays active. You know what I mean? I do things outside. If you don't do it, then don't expect the generation behind you to do it. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So the, the day before Thanksgiving, just recently, you tweeted, let's remember something. We can disagree on politics and religion, but at the end of the day, we all want what's best for our country, our family, and our friends. We just come from different places on what's mo- most important to us. Take all the disagreements away and we still love each other. One, why did you tweet it? And two, what do you make of just the political climate currently? Uh, People are just angry and they don't understand that. Now, are there the fringes on the left and the right? That's who we see on the news. You know, if you're a Republican, you're hearing all about the lunatics on the left. (laughs) You know, if you're a Democrat, all you're hearing about is the the rednecks on the right, you know, the crazy ones. You know what I mean? Uh, And that's who we're shown because that's newsworthy and you can't attack the media for it. Cause the media gives us what we want. It's a and mirror. We love drama. Yeah. And we love, look at the shows that we love on Netflix. We love drama. You know what I mean? We love sociopaths, all that <laughs> is what we love. And so we want to see it, but in real life, think about friends of yours. If you're a Democrat, think about your Republican friends and vice versa that aren't crazy. 
they want the best and they are coming from different places. You know, one side is more conservative or more, you know, worried about, you know, the, the military and protecting the country. Another side is more about, hey, we got to take care of those who are less fortunate. Right. You know what I mean? And so, and that's been proven throughout history that tribes have done that. That you have those that step up in wartime and those who are in charge in peacetime, because there is a difference. But we live in a, an environment now that there is never just peace. There's never just war. It's a never ending cycle of of this and that. And then in, in politics, you have you know money that gets involved. That's a whole other thing we get into. But no, I think at the end of the day, the average American wants the best for their families, for their friends, for the country. Mm -hmm. And we get all been out of shape because of something we read on Facebook or we saw on the news. And it's not as accurate. Not that it's not accurate. It's accurate to what happened in that situation. Yeah. But the everyday American means well and wants the best. And we're yeah. just coming from different angles. And I've always thought that. And that's why I tweeted because I was so bothered by, you know, it, this ha same thing happened four years ago. And then guess what? In four years, we're going to be doing this again. <laughs> God. <laughs> it, it does. I, I think you're right in that it has felt kind of like a reality TV show. It's like everywhere you turn, there's more drama. There's more. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much like I, I like to live and think in moderation. So it's very hard for me to um, empathize with the extremes. Yeah. What, Noah, is politics in your future? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no presidential run in 2024. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, you know, if I, you know, one time I considered like mayor. Okay. Be, and I'll tell you why, because the only way you really, with smaller levels, things can get done. Yeah. Things get done in community size level. And within a community, you can, you can be, conservative liberal whatever and get those things done but when it gets bigger it gets overblown and it gets yep. harder to control just like they say you know the bigger the mass is the dumber the people you know mm. um and so that's as far as i would ever consider politics because i do i want to you know that may be something that down the road i i can't say i'd never do it because i love working with people and anything that would help but i think that's as far up as i would go because i i feel like mayors are way more important than people realize and they're, it's less, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not effective. As, yeah. Yeah, it's more effective because I feel like when you get higher up, it becomes more of a reality show. Yep. What is the next chapter in Noah Galloway's book? You know, I'm not real sure. I, I want to continue what, you know, here it is. I, I'm in this great relationship, this woman who, is all about yoga and and we have and that's a new side of fitness that I'm learning but she loves to work with others and help people and she's always done these Bali retreats that's you awesome know, she, and so we've been talking about here it is we're we're older we're in a relationship that is started at a later in life than like I've been divorced twice yeah and she's been smart and never been married you know, made a big, big, I was worried about you know, her life and focusing on what needs to be done and until she found what she was looking for. And hopefully that continues to be me. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think her and I together have talked about wanting to put this together and, and do things to help others. Cause you know, I want to, I love working with people and I have this desire to want to work with lower income though especially when it comes to health and fitness yeah I feel like health and fitness has been portrayed as something that only the rich yeah like an elitist like yeah. yep yeah and you know you got people out there that are telling you don't eat this don't eat that but buy my 70 dollar bottle of crap that has no proof of what's in it and be healthy i'm like no 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 health and fitness like when i was on the cover of men's health i took no new i didn't take any supplements yeah i ate healthy and exercised you know, and it's like, the that is doable. Yes, it is doable. And it's all about educating. And I want to, and so I want to combine our worlds and see what we can do. In fact, uh, tonight, starting tonight at like nine o'clock and then into the morning, I'm giving three speeches online as, and afterwards she's each one, she's doing a yoga class for the same companies. Can I join that? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. just for over there, they're they're late at night because it's Belgium. Yep. Uh, you know, to, they're all in different countries. Yeah. And I'm excited about it because it's her and I. This is the first time we're meshing our worlds together, and I think that's the next chapter I want to. That's get into. awesome. That's that's awesome because I think that you you hit on exactly what like a true partnership is, right? It's like you are both growing together and you're building together versus one person going and the other one gets left behind. Yes. And that happens all the time. You see it in fitness. Yeah. You, know, you, have two, you have two people that have battled with maybe obesity or whatever it is. And one starts getting in shape. And the other one right. does it. Well, then, you know, the one getting in shape is resentful of the other one for not being a supporter of the other one. So they're not being supportive. They feel like they're being left behind and they get angry. I mean, it's a whole mental thing that goes into it. You have to see from both sides and totally. it does, it, it destroys, it can destroy relationships. Cool. Well, thank you. Noah. my last question is what is one thing you hope people take away from your story? Uh, that anything is possible that, you know what? The, like we've life never, no one ever said life is easy. Uh, crap happens and yeah. you just learn to, to deal with it. And, and that life is nothing but a book of chapters. So don't get hung up on one. I love that. The, the one thing I've learned from, you know, reading so many biographies and profiles of people is that the, the most successful ones are the ones who believe that you can always reinvent yourself no matter what happens. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You know, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Paulina. You're awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course.